Ambassador, we are, we are both um, former diplomats, and I wanted to just begin by asking you um, a question about the nature of diplomacy. Um, so, Harold Nicholson, the, the sort of Boswell of our profession, once described diplomacy as the world's um, second oldest profession. <laughs> I think we all know what the first one is, but we won't go there. But for all the patina of antiquity, very few people today really understand what diplomats do or what the purpose of diplomacy is. So may I ask you, what is diplomacy? And what do diplomats actually do, and to what end? Well, thank you, and I think you would get several thousand answers from my <laughs> colleagues. But before I answer, I very much want to thank Gwendolyn for coming to Denver last night and driving me here today, and Elise for all of your support in, in bringing me here. It's good afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> and I, it's great to see you after so many years. Welcome, welcome to America. <laughs> I think that we would think about it as a craft. Diplomacy is a craft. You have your toolbox or your toolkit, and that includes language, resources, the interagency process, others, as well as the most important thing, working with our allies and partners, hoping we're well resourced, nurturing that relationship, returning to that toolbox, using the WD-40 if you want, that we always nurture that so that wrench never gets rusty because you're going to need it. And if you ignore that wrench, somebody else is going to have utilized it, put WD-40 in their toolbox, in their craft, and you're going to lose out. So I think that diplomats all around the world, from whatever country, employ it uh, and use it very well. The only thing that I will say uh, Ray, that will disappoint you is that I, I represent the world's finest diplomas, diplomats, <laughs> Foreign Service of the United States of America. Um, <clears throat> the sun has set, uh, but we are, we believe that we are the finest. And I, I say that in all seriousness. It is because the British Foreign Service, which we have copied much from, is divided into how you, you do the, the work. We do the consular work, the visa work, the immigration work, uh, as well as political, economic, and management, and, and consular. So we think, and we're, we are everywhere, and we should be more places, in fact. We're not, we're in insufficient places. Um, but we work, our closest allies are the Brits. Um, and then, of course, the Five Eyes, the Canadians, the Aussies, um, and, the, and the Kiwis, but the Brits, we don't keep much from each other, <laughs> you know, when we, and I'm sure that President Biden and Prime Minister uh, Johnson have spoken today, even though President Biden was in Korea heading to Japan. I guarantee this is the way things work. And they, if they're only speaking once a day now, it's rare. It's rare, it is, it is. Yeah. Ambassador, thank you. Um, in the post-Cold War world, um, the role of diplomacy has visibly expanded mm -hmm. in the face of a more unstable mm -hmm. and more uh, complex and more mm -hmm. dangerous environment. We have a return of intense great mm -hmm. power rivalry, new relationships with new power centers, mm -hmm. including NGOs and other non-state mm -hmm. actors. We also have new issues, of course, COVID and global climate change. So how have all these changes um, modified the character and practice of diplomacy? Well, thank you. I think we weren't prepared for everything. We had insufficient resources. Um, I still believe that human interaction is the most important. And when I say we are not well resourced, I'm saying that, <clears throat> think about in Russia or Ukraine. In Russia, we had an embassy in Moscow and a consulate in St. Petersburg. We should have done what we did in the early 20th century and even up to the 70s, where we had eight consuls in France, a bunch in Germany. We had five consuls in Brazil. We had a consulate in Cebu. We 
because although our intelligence community and military are doing great work now, we have to admit everybody got it wrong over Russia and Ukraine. If you are there, we have great intelligence community, great. But that, you can learn what somebody's going to say, you can tell what somebody's going to say before they go in the meeting, what they're going to, but do you really know what they're going to do? Do you really understand? I was telling your wonderful high school students here today that if I came, to, I'm from New York City. I live in Florida now. But if I came here and spent a week and started writing about Colorado Springs, would I really know it? No way. No way. So why do we think we can be in Moscow and write about Russia and really be telling everything? Impossible. We need to be in so many places for a lot of reasons, not just intel, to sell our, to we need to increase our exports. And you have to get to know people there. Everybody I knew in Zimbabwe were buying their products from Guangzhou. They're not even looking at us, but we're not trying to, to get them. The soft power where we send, we used to send Louis Armstrong and Ella Fitzgerald, those people. Maybe we can't afford Beyonce, but we could afford, we could afford the Dave Matthews Band. You know, we could afford Hootie and the Blowfish. So, we, we need to do, redo that. Um, we, have, we have teachers in the Foreign Service. Um, we need to have more of that. I was uh, telling Gwen on the way up here, um, you watch CNN on Saturdays, you see a woman named Frederica Whitfield, who is the, the hostess. She grew up in the Foreign Service. Her father, Mel Whitfield, was one of the greatest sprinters of all time. Two-time Olympian, gold, silver medalist. He and others were employed by the US government to teach developing country athletes how to run. It's not a major course. Um, we can t every summer the NBA comes to the uh, Philippines. Basketball is the number one sport in the Philippines. Does anybody know that? <laughs> other than the two of us. <laughs> That's where I got to meet Kobe Bryant, and Kevin Durant, all these people. But it shouldn't just be the NBA. We need to do all of these things. Because when we don't, we fall asleep. And now, whether you like it or not, we are going to, we hope that Ukraine prevails. And, and if they do, we're gonna have to rebuild it, along with the European and Japan and Korea problem. Everybody else may throw in a dime, but we're gonna have to rebuild it. And a lot of that comes because we were asleep at the wheel, we did stop Putin when he went into to Crimea and uh, Georgia, and this I fear is 1939 all over again, I, and I very much hope I'm wrong. But it's going to still be a financial cost, and we have to be ready, so let's prevent that, because after that, it's going to be China and Taiwan. And that's going to be a much greater cost to our children and our grandchildren. I'd like to thank you. Um, I can't resist making a brief British cultural point. Um, when the wall came down and the Czech Republic became in independent and free of the Soviet domination communism, uh, the way they chose to mark that was rather special. Uh, Vasil Pavel uh, went to St. Peter Hall, an old friend of mine, and said, Peter, listen, can you bring the Rolling Stones to, can you bring the Rolling Stones to Prague? And he said, yeah, sure, I'll try. And they, and they came. So it was one distinctively British way of celebrating the yes, yes, yes. of the Czech Republic. Um, but more seriously, Ambassador, you've touched on something that we want to discuss here as well, and that is, is the US Foreign Service equipped and funded to meet all of these new challenges? Uh, no. Um, 2000, I can't remember. I can't remember the year now, but it was, uh, August of uh, 2005 or six, Dr. Rice had us go to Camp David to brief President Bush on the need to increase the size of the Foreign Service. Um, hamburgers, the best hamburgers I ever had in my life. And that was because Bill Clinton loves hamburgers. I, I kid you not. 
Uh, General Pace and I went in the kitchen afterwards. These were the best burgers. But we, what we realized, one out of every four foreign service officers at that time were deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. We had more people in military bands, 52,000, than we had in the foreign service. And we told that to President Bush, and he agreed to increase the size, as did uh, then when Secretary Clinton came in, she did also, but it is not enough because the breadth and the depth of our challenges have, have really changed. One part, we pay doctors an extra salary in the foreign service, but we don't pay our IT people that. And to me, that is myopic. So if you have most of your IT people who are making sixty to hundred thousand dollars a year, when they can triple that easily in the private sector, you're not going to get the best. And we're very good at the offense, but very bad at the defense. The chief IT person in the State Department is leaving just after a year to go to the private sector. You can't turn down these salaries. Now we don't have to match everybody, but you have to be competitive in because the world has changed. In that, in that area. We help sell, uh, one of your jobs is to sell Boeings, to, to sell, to open the world for Coke and Pepsi, and all, we spend all that time. Help sell products from each, each state. We don't have enough people to do that. Not every state has trade reps. Um, next year, there's going to be, unfortunately, a food drought around the world because of Ukraine and, and, and Russia. One of our number one experts is wheat. Uh, we are going to have to do it. We'll probably be in competition with Brazil. But we need to have more agricultural officers to help pave the way. It's not so easy that you just don't start giving away or selling wheat all of a sudden. All of these things take time and preparation. So we are kind of stuck in 1980s diplomacy when we need to be doing um, 2050. Um, in his book, America in the World, um, Bob Zellick, a very distinguished foreign policy practitioner on the six US presidents, has suggested, and I quote, successful leaders of American diplomacy need to work with the political factions that will establish the foundations of US foreign policy, close quote. My question is, though, how can the leaders of American diplomacy do this today when the country is so polarized and when those polarized factions advocate such uh, radically different concepts of America's role in the world. I wish I knew, <laughs> to, be, to be honest. However, I do have some optimism. We've seen that. Um, American people really don't pay attention to foreign policy in most days. But everybody's paying attention to Ukraine to some extent. Um, a year ago, none of us knew Zelensky, but now we all do. Um, and for most, most congresspersons and senators, they are supporting the, what President Biden, and Secretary Ross, and Secretary Blinken are trying to do in Ukraine. And the reason they're supporting it is because the American people, we support the underdog. We can see that people are being massacred and killed for no reason, and we don't want this to happen. So you have crazies in every political party. Let's not kid ourselves. We used to try to keep them at bay. It's, it's kind of hard in the social media age. But the American people say this is what we need to do. So that's why it's there. Now it's going to be up to the American people to sustain this. Um, and I hope that uh, we can and look at other parts before they become challenges. The CNN, Fox, and all of these other sites, they're doing what they think we want them to do. What we want them to do is stand up for American values. We do the right thing. And when we don't, we should be cursed, because most times we're trying to do the right thing. And if so we have to do that, and that's all I ask as, as we go forward. Thank you, Ambassador. We're going to shift as we, as yes. we have agreed onto 
point, the point of policy and away from craft with uh, diplomacy. I think you hinted at this earlier. Um, would you agree with some commentators who suggest that in the light of Putin's horrific actions in Ukraine, that American and by extension Western policy towards Russia over the past 20 years or more has been unrealistic or simply flawed? Oh, I'm, I'm not the Russia expert. Uh, my colleagues are. I would, I would, and they argue over whether President Bush uh, offered um, NATO membership as he was going out of office and couldn't do it. And I, you know, I don't know, and I'm always hesitant to criticize uh, my colleagues that I wasn't making that policy. Um, what I do, what I do know, is that we have to get it right about the board, um, and that's going to take time resource of the government. I, and I, if I were President uh, Biden and in, in working now, I would be planning, and I, I would hope they are, how are we going to build Ukraine? How are we going to keep these coalitions together? Not just NATO, which has found itself, but if you look at the African Union, the Organization of American States, ASEAN and Asia, they're mostly feckless organizations. But we can't afford for them to be feckless. You've got million Chinese in Africa. You've got uh, China building stadiums, parliaments. In Zimbabwe, where I just left, China just built a parliament. What flag is above the Chinese, the Zimbabwean parliament, the Chinese flag? And now it's above seven countries' parliaments. Um, we can't just say to African countries, China is giving you bad loans, don't take them. If we don't offer an alternative. That's why people go to loan sharks, right? You've got to have an alternative. And it's in our interest to have alternatives. So that's why we have to invest in all of these, in all of these countries. We thought China and Russia wanted to be like us in some ways. We didn't expect them to be dem democracies. Let's, let's not kid ourselves. We were hoping that bringing them into the WTO, opening the world, and it was American businesses with our own government encouragement who offered so much to, to China. Um, we hoped that that would moderate. It has not. And we should find ways to cooperate with China where we can, especially on issues such as climate change and weather, which is different. Those are two different issues, and I hate to see people conflate them. Uh, on helping developing countries. But we also have to be better than they are in other places. And not being there doesn't even give you a chance to be better. Anybody who's in the private sector here, you can't sell a product if you're not there. You know, If you're not there, you can't sell a product. So why do we think as Americans we can sell our product when we're absent? Not gonna happen. I'm going to take over. Let's turn to one last subject, yeah, yeah. looking to the future, because um, I know you're not an expert on Russia on, on Ukraine, but um, I think my sense certainly is that Western policy on Ukraine is clear about what it doesn't want. Yeah. That we don't want the Ukraine to be on the battlefield, and we certainly don't want to see the Russians using nuclear weapons. But would you agree that the West uh, is still unclear on what it does want to achieve in terms of I would agree with that. And that's probably going to continue because what's best is for Ukraine to continue to be independent and Russia out, even from Donbass, even if it's unrealistic. You're going to have some countries, and everybody has to act out of self-interest. They're, they're energy dependent, take 20 years to get off that, who will say, look, let's cut a deal. Let Russia have this arm. That won't be Lithuania saying that, <laughs> or Moldova saying that uh, these days, or, or Finland or Sweden, but others will say that. Um, and that is going to have to be a very tough balancing act for President Biden as well as Prime Minister uh, Johnson, because you have to keep a coalition together. You have to sustain this over time, so you're going to have to listen to them cajole them, try to get them back and understand the danger. And it's not going to be easy because if you think we have high gas and energy prices,
look at what's happening in Western Europe. You know, so we can't just tell them to say no when their gas prices are going up when they don't have food. It's going to, it's going to be a, a, a delicate balance. Uh, thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you. you very much. Um, we're going to open the uh, questions to the floor, and the first person I want to turn to was my good friend Carl, a distinguished soldier, who got some, an important question about the relationship between military and uh, diplomacy. Ambassador Thomas, thank you very much. It is uh, such a great speaker here. Um, such a delight. It's just, uh, I love it. I love it. Um, I would like to go and uh, go back to something you said earlier. And it kind of ties into your service with uh, US SOCOM, mm -hmm. which I think is just fantastic, and the sovereign challenge, mm -hmm. which you're part of. Um, how do you think the military, uh, special operations, special forces, and foreign area officers, um, how do you think it can integrate or can support what you say where we lack that WD-40 to kind of lubricate um, diplomacy around the world? And how have you seen it lubricate diplomacy? Well, thank you, sir, for that. Um, I think uh, the special force soft community is have authority that they didn't use before. Um, one is human trafficking. Um, but what we, what we try to do is understand that how can we marry the private sector, public sector, academic think tanks with, with the soft community? First, introducing them to each other. Uh, we're trying to work together on, on projects putting military alumni training together, programs. Um, and understanding is what, that's why I'm so high is because of this, on the private sector working with the soft, uh, with the soft community, especially in terms of cyber. So it's been a slow but steady process. General Clark is leaving, we'll have another CG soon. But we have gone to New York and worked with the Northern, North, <coughs> work with the Wall Street bankers and say, what can you do? And it's great because they see a Green Beret, they love that, truly, you know, that opens doors. Uh, but getting Wall Street to say, look, we can do this. Getting Carnegie Mellon University to improve facial recognition, weapon recognition, what can we, can we fund that or can we have the private sector fund that? Those type of synergies through think tanks, businesses, academia, and working on human trafficking, which was an authority not used, but it's modern day slavery. And that brings non-governmental organizations into it. And you know, when I joined the Foreign Service, most of my colleagues were veterans of uh, Vietnam. Today, fewer than 5% of the Foreign Service are military veterans. So, and the private sector is the same or even lower. So the first object was to get people to know each other, to understand their missions and see where we can, we can cooperate. And that's what we're, we're trying to do and I expect that they will, uh, uh, under the new CG, the new commanding general, will continue to do that. At least I hope so. Ambassador Thomas. Yes, sir. To the new generation of State Department and Foreign Service people, hopefully coming on up yes. and getting engaged. What do you see that's maybe new that they need to do for us? And how do we change some things so they can be guaranteed or hopeful of a viable career path that's worthy of theirs? Well, fun funding from Congress, they, they decide how many people we can hire. But what I told this uh, table is study languages. Uh, travel, uh, learn somebody else's culture, read voraciously, whether it is the Denver Post or the New York Times or whatever, read The Economist. I would get the thing, the other thing that young people, and, and I hope this is exception, they're not gonna watch Bloomberg, but they need to be introduced to finance and neuroscience. 
And it could be through Amazon or Walmart, whatever, these are major global corporations. These are modern diplomats. They would say Amazon and Walmart would say they have a, a diplomatic corps. Um, that's what they, I would hope they would do. Understanding not everyone's going to join the Foreign Service, uh, but when they, when they do, um, people see on TV, they think they need to go to parties or something. It's work, you know? I never let my people take notes. Uh, because you have to, and, and you're looking at me, no, no notes, no notes. Because Dr. Rice didn't let us take notes. We, 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 you can remember, you can concentrate. Because if you're talking to me and I'm taking notes, ooh, I gotta change what I'm saying. Just like having a camera on. Uh, but the most, the two most important things are learning how to write, you mean active voice, uh, you know, I'm a, Foreign Service, we're grammarians, so we don't like split infinitive, beginning sentences with however, uh, ending sentences with prepositions, that kills. But that's, that's, you know, I gotta adjust to that. I gotta adjust. Um, the other thing which we Americans are terrible at is listening. We have to listen and be patient listeners and understand what that person wants. Even though I may have the best intentions coming from New York to improve Colorado Springs, I may not bring, bring you what you really want or need. You know what you need. And now, I may not be able to give it to you. It may not be in my toolbox. Maybe it is in China's toolbox, but I at least have to listen. First of all, why should I waste our foreign aid by giving you something that's not gonna work, or that you don't need, uh, or you don't want? But also, that's so paternalistic. How can I come from New York and tell you this is what you need? So now you're gonna go to a foreign country where you don't speak the language and say, this is what you need just because I have more money? They're gonna say, screw you. And this happens to us. So I, I would like to see that change. Thank you, Ambassador. My question is along similar vein, but more on the process. Yes. I've had the fortunate experience, some might say, of going through the Foreign Service process and stalling out twice. That's okay. Including after sitting on the register for 18 months. Yeah. And so I'm curious what advice you have for people who are interested in going through the process but find it a little demoralizing. Oh, uh, well, I know people that took that exam 16, 18 times, back when you could take it three times a year. So what track or cone were you trying to do? That's your issue. <laughs> no, I, and I told you that earlier. Right? I am a political officer, and we love being political officers, that, that is. But today, that's the hardest part. So look at economic or public affairs. Key your essay to your experiences, because the QEP, the quantitative process, uh, which I put in as director general to my everlasting regret, so you could curse me for that. I wish I had, I'm serious, I did. I wish I had not. But it has to uh, be on your experience. And then the oral exam, we can tutor, we're allowed to tutor people for the orals. So if you ever email me, I'll get somebody to tutor you for nothing. Really, we do that. And the only thing we'll ask you in 10 or 15 years is tutor somebody else. Uh, and I'm very serious about that. Um, so look at something other than political because these days, it's going to be very, very difficult. Most of our scholarship students, we have a, a mini ROTC program called uh, Wrangle and Pickering, and it's to diversify the Foreign Service. And in diversifying the Foreign Service, that means parental income about 100,000 or above, under. And the reason we do that is because we are very Ivy League oriented. If you're from Mississippi, you went to Yale. If you're from California, you went to Harvard. That's the Foreign Service. Or the little, you know, or you went to uh, Bowdoin or Amherst. So the way we're trying to diversify, and we, this year's class is great. We've got kids from Western Kentucky. We got kids from Nebraska Wesleyan. So all we do, that is our way of, of everybody defines diversity in a different way. But the way we're defining it is family income because that is going to bring us that kid from the University of Alaska, the University of Hawaii. And it's going to be a little, a little challenging for them. 
Uh, some of you may know John Bolton. I knew Bolton for years. One of the reasons he hated Yale, his, his father was a fireman in Baltimore. Now he gets to Yale in 1964, and that was real Yale. And you say fireman, they say, oh, fireman's fun? Is that a real fireman? Oh, never. He was not fitting in. So when we, today, it's Ivy and Georgetown. We've got to make sure that that kid from Western Kentucky or Ole Miss feels comfortable and gets the same opportunity as the rest of us. So that's our university. And I really hope you support it. So. Mr. Ambassador, yes. welcome to Colorado Springs. Yes, Mr. Georgetown. Thank you. you bet. Um, so I'm going to shift gears a little mm -hmm. bit here and look at the Pacific region. Yeah. You're a little bit more yeah. familiar. In 1980, the trade uh, bypass for the Pacific region by tax year. And our focus has been on that. I was just on a call with the uh, Commerce Department the other day. In Japan, robots uh, are one to 90 people. In the United States, they're 490 to about one robot. Where do you see American technology, particularly moving in cyber and developing the manufacturing area? Where do we have to concentrate on in the Pacific region? with regard to understanding and understanding that China's there with regard to economic challenges, even on the Eastern Front with Russia and Japan and Korea. Where, where do you think our interests lie and where should we concentrate economically? Oh, <coughs> thank you. I'm not clearly not an expert on this issue, but I would say I have some friends that uh, work in, in the private uh, sector space in that, and they talk about how they have cyber attacks every day. Uh, from China on the, on the whole 5G system and, and the next system after that. And they say that under whomever's administration, our government hasn't done enough to help protect them. I haven't worked closely with the private sector in ways that they deem is, is correct. Uh, so that's what I would say. The other thing I would say, and I'm sorry I'm shifting a little bit because I'm not an expert on that, is I would like us to use this time to develop more alternative supply chains. We clearly uh, had success in, in China, but that's costing us in many ways. So let's be more creative and innovative than in the Chinese are today. Why are we not helping Poland or Kenya or uh, Colombia be an alternative supply chain? or the Philippines or Cambodia. Everybody, we grew up saying, don't put all your eggs in one basket. We did, but we put most of them. So why not have a different type of aid? Our aid, we tried one thing before. When, when I first went to the White, uh, the White House, when they were first putting up AFRICOM, uh, it was more difficult to fly from, Af to, it was from an, one African country to the, another African country was very difficult they'd have to fly to Europe, to London or Paris. So we tried with Africa, Africa Command to put in airports in East Africa and West Africa. Um, and the only thing we were saying, those will be your commercial airports, but we need to use them whenever we can for military. The Europeans really sank that, and we hadn't, uh, for, their, for their own purposes. Uh, but we need to do something back like that and sustain them. Uh, not but more than just the, the airport. Helping them the way we help the Chinese. Uh, it was American technology, it was American managers going to China, doing that, who, who helped China become modern in transfer of technology. So why can't we do this around the world with our allies and partners instead of, we have to give them humanitarian aid and we should, but instead of just doing that, uh, help them stand on their feet a lot quicker and protect protect us. I'm, when I, I, I'm going, I'll be home on Wednesday, taking my, I had a, 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 a pebble come in my, my wind, windshield, and two weeks ago I was supposed to have it repaired, and they have a, they have a shortage of that. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Either they blame it, you know, they blame everything on COVID or supply chain, but it really is. Satellite call me, they have a shortage. So, why not? I, 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 that's what I would like to see. So, yes, sir.
in the case of Ukraine, mm -hmm. the support for this adventure in Africa has been qualified mm -hmm. at best. Mm -hmm. I suppose if I were African, recalling uh, my contact with the West, I mm -hmm. might be a little difficult to mm -hmm. translate too. Well, what do you think about the um, way we might take a knowledge of mm -hmm. uh, to go a little more support in Africa? For That's going to be tough, sir. Uh, Kenya was one of the few African countries to come out early and to condemn Ukraine. But if you look at the world, Israel did not until uh, Lavrov called them Nazis. India surely has not. Why? Because everybody's eye for writing out of their own self-interest. Um, and what they fear, and there's nothing we can do to change this. So what they fear is, they, if they come solely to work with the U.S. on military assistance, on development assistance, business, that when they do something that we deem bad, we're going to cut them off. And typically, we do. I'm not a big believer in sanctions, despite Ukraine, because they really don't change governments or regimes, and I understand why they have to be done. But uh, and not all of these governments are good governments. Not all of them do take care of their people. And they know that China and Russia are not going to ask questions about the behavior of this government. So no matter how well we do on our diplomacy, no matter how much we offer them, they're going to try to keep China and Russia in their back pocket. Um, so what we should do is really try to engage the people in the best way we can. And we're not doing that today. So it's hard to tell a country where you're largely absent economically that they should support us, that we have ignored for years. That, so China, every developing country President gets to go to China. Group individuals, they get to meet President Xi. Their families get trips, they get scholarships, all, all of those things. Uh, no matter who's the president of the United States, when developing countries come, they bring them in groups. They usually do not get bilats one-on-ones. People are human. They don't, they don't feel so loved. Do we have to do a better job of that? And understanding that they're still going to keep China and, and Russia in their back pocket. Just one last one. So earlier you talked about like being African. Yes. Um, I was wondering if there's any way that diplomacy can help with stuff like being African as well as being that more of the friendly country with other people. Uh, we do that every day. Um, there's human trafficking in every city in the United States. Major human trafficking. Uh, when I was in uh, Arizona, Mrs. McCain was the first of two laws to, to really change Arizona. Uh, it was our passion when I was in the Philippines. Uh, we worked with the local and state governments, um, some of whom were corrupt, but we also found you, you have to work with the judiciary, with prosecutors, uh, with churches, uh, and we give awards out for people who are doing the best job. Now what you find is you peel the onion back. Uh, the youngest baby I saw trafficked was 18 months old. And there's a golfer, Ben Crane, and he and his wife were very involved in, 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 in that. Uh, one of the things we did in the Philippines, in a city called uh, Anaris, where Clark Air Force Base was, um, you're a little too young, but we would take young female foreign service officers in their 20s, send them into bars to talk to people. And we were featured on Nightline because we, we got uh, Americans who were pedophiles. You have Koreans, Australians also. Now what we can do is, if we catch you, we have you deported back to the United States, charge you, 
and then we confiscate your whatever property you owe, and it goes into a fund. But who wants that for their child? Uh, we, in, in up there, Clark, prostitution is legal. We give the, these women um, shots. I went and I went to some of these places where they were waiting online, and when you look in their eyes, it's almost like they're deaf. It's deaf. Um, and when you try to get them back to their families, they become transactional. And you want to avoid that. And it's a high recidivism rate. Um, lack of economic opportunity. But if you look on Nightline, you'll see what we did. But you also look at, years ago, Diane Sawyer taught me about the effects of that in cities like Portland and Seattle, where American girls were lured into working in clubs and prostitution. And it's the same thing. So what we have to have, understand is a global, it's a global problem. Um, and it's a global challenge, but we, uh, well, for my wife, that's her particular passion in, in, in working in that. Uh, so, but we do do, um, and where I had a blind side in, in, in uh, the Philippines, unfortunately, we didn't realize until well into it that there were males being trafficked also. Not just for labor, which is a huge thing, but also for sex. And we started working with a group. We, with two boys, formed a, uh, helped them open a, a coffee shop right underneath the L near De La Salle University. Um, so people get ashamed, they get angry when they hear about it, but I'm telling you, it doesn't just exist in the Philippines. It exists right here in Colorado Springs. Because I guarantee you there's a young girl or boy being trafficked for labor or sex. Um, but we have a, an ambassador for that. We have, uh, uh, but we, you have to we have to continue working on that issue. Ambassador, you worked in a couple of nations that uh, wrote about the democracy and wound up being one man, one vote. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and increasingly, we are seeing that moving from the developing world into the Western world. Mm -hmm. What role does the foreign service need to play in, in promoting democracy and are we doing an adequate job? Well, I think we do. We, we try to promote democracy every day. Um, but the world has changed. We're not going to send, and the American people were not going to want us to send the Marines into Zimbabwe to keep it a democracy. Because that's what you're going to have to do. Now, you saw African nations in West Africa uh, when they had, two years ago, Gambia had an election. The incumbent president didn't want to leave. The Af West African nations threatened to send in troops. And they got the incumbent to leave. To Bethesda, Maryland, of course, where we had a house. <laughs> um, and, but, so it's, it's a more difficult job because they know that that hammer of the military coming in is not happening. And nor should it. Nor should it. We don't want lives at, at risk. Uh, so it's a much more difficult job today. But if, uh, as I told uh, folks that were, Ms. Cobb heard this, so you'll have to hear it again, is um, yesterday, um, in November 2017, when Zimbabwe uh, was removing um, the dictator Mugabe, uh, we were told by all the time. Russians and Chinese were their best friends. And then the Americans were all weather friends. And we could not be counted on. Those were all the things that are they called terrible names. And when they, when they had the march and the Russian embassy right next to our embassy, when they marched past our embassy, those Zimbabweans shouted, USA, USA. Because they were suppressed. They weren't stupid. They wanted democracy just as much as the people in Ukraine want democracy. They just are unable to get it. And they probably are unable to get it for the foreseeable future. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't work with civil society organizations there. We shouldn't work with NGOs. We should try to press them to have as free and fair elections as possible, because that's all that's in our toolbox today. 
diplomats and residents. Uh, I was sent to Arizona State in 2013 uh, because there's a large Latino and uh, Native American population. Uh, we now have at several schools in Miami, uh, Florida International University of Miami. Uh, we have at Morehouse and Spelman. We have at, uh, so uh, two years ago this decision was made to have diplomats and residents. We used to have one actually at the University of Denver, but the Director General, who was Ani Chacon, who was a Colorado graduate, <laughs> closed it down, moved it somewhere else. But um, we, we, we are, we've started the last couple of years doing that. But we've also realized that we need to go down to middle school, high school level. And we're going to all of America. Uh, uh, people of color, gay, transgender, whomever straight, bond, we, we, we want to recruit all of America. Because as I said, look, I'm very proud I went to Columbia University, but that, that's, that was a foreign service. We don't have all the answers. Um, so we are doing that. And we are recruiting, uh, we, Henry Kissinger, Madeline Albright were immigrants from America. Colin Powell was the son of him. We're going to first generation. We have a lot of first generation uh, immigrants at Arizona State. And so we are doing that. It is a hard exam to pass though. Uh, it's an SAT, the first part, usually based on family income tells you how people are gonna do on the SAT or the ACT. Uh, we wanna keep the exam as sacrosanct. So uh, we gotta make sure that kids are prepared in middle school or high school for that and usually uh, zip code determines your, your priorities, um, unfortunately, but that's, that's the way it is. The reason we don't want to switch from an exam, because that will guarantee uh, political interference, and it will from both parties, trust me. So, um, but yes, we're, we're trying, and, and that clearly is it. Uh, I, to this day, I'm still the only African American as an executive secretary the only one that was ambassador to the Philippines, uh, the only one that was in the National Security Council for South Asia, not because people in front of me weren't smart or prepared, they weren't given that opportunity. But I want everybody to have that opportunity. I don't care who they are. Uh, and it would be, uh, obviously I'd be happy to see more African Americans. My wife is from the Philippines, so I'd like to see more Filipino Americans than that. Uh, but to just concentrate on one group alone that's going to create polarization and short-term success. We can't do that. Um, I want to thank you, firstly, for being here today and also for the quick conversation we had. Sorry, it was good luck. Enlightening, thank you. Uh, I kind of want to touch back on some of the things you asked, you had spoken about earlier. Um, you know, we look at the sanctions in Russia, and I think one of the, as you said, you're not the biggest fan of sanctions. The Russians also did a really good job insulating their economy. Um, and you look back at 1939 and things like that, when the world, a lot of those economies were insulated as well. And then you mentioned we put maybe too many bags or eggs in the basket with China. And now we have some concerns about Taiwan. Uh, my question would be, do you think there's a silver lining in our economic relationship with the Chinese and um, you know any potential conflict in Taiwan? Is there space 
case to work with the Chinese? Because you, know, you talk about supply chain issues and how that's been affecting the United States. We're clearly very tied to them. Um, I don't know what the secrets, I don't know, whatever that means. Well, look, I, 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 thank you. I didn't want to come over too quickly. I don't think American policymakers were trying to make errors or trying to be involved. They were really trying to do the best with the toolbox they had at the time. Um, and they were very, very, very serious uh, about this. And um, again, I also said they didn't expect China to become a democracy. They wanted them to become better behaviors. And Taiwan were major investors in China, if you, if you look at the, the, the economic history. Um, but the American private sector, look, it's whether we like it or not, for some companies it's gonna be hard to survive in America. It was cheaper to manufacture overseas. They made that choice. They also signed agreements that said they would do A, B, C, and D in China. Yeah, they did, to make money. Uh, we, we have to recognize that. You can call it the right thing to do or you can call it corporate greed, well, whoever you look at it. I don't wanna blame people in any call, but that's the way it was. And you should study that so you don't uh, you go into whatever future economic or trade relations our nation has with that understanding. Um, you have to study, but we also have to, to move forward. And that's why I was talking about the alternative supply chains. And not that I'm against, these are the most intrusive sanctions that I have seen. Usually sanctions are easy to, have been easy to get around. <clears throat> because of one country or four or five countries imposing them. You need basically the whole world. And they are not meant ever to topple regimes, but to change behavior. Usually they, so we have sanctions against Zimbabwe. Mugabe can get around everything, but if you're trying to send money via Western Union back to your family, that could get captured. We had, <coughs> excuse me, up to, well, today it might have been increased. But when I retired in 2018, we had 28 people working in the Treasury Department do sanctions for the whole world. That's all we had. And I'm sure that hasn't been increased to 100. And they did the whole world. So if you're sending money back from New York or London to Harare, and they capture it, that $50 you're trying to send your mom, that American bank can hold that money for 90 days. And if you don't apply for it properly, they get to keep it. Doesn't endear us to the average person. You know, um, so you, you gotta look at all parts of this. Uh, but for Russia, sanctions are a good tool. And getting other countries to slowly buy into this is a tough job. And keeping them to do it, there are many places uh, to hide your money, not as more as before. Financial transactions can be changed. We're not going to make Putin poor. And we don't want Russia to implode. Uh, but we want this to stop, and we don't want to think China to say they can go into Taiwan very soon. Once they have a carrier away. Because when I left in 2013, if you told me that the Marcos were going to be back, I would say no way. If you told me Duterte would have been elected, I would say no way. 
but I was wrong. And I think about this a lot. I know the Supreme Court of the Philippines is looking at it. Marcos Cantrell was in the United States. Uh, a, he doesn't have the charge. Charges are not a conviction or anything. You can't be convicted. So A, he travels. B, he becomes president. He is president-select now. Then he'll be president-elect when the Philippines gets back. Um, any president can come for United Nations General Assembly. Too, that's, that's, that's up to him. Um, but you have to look at why the Filipino, because this is the first election since his father was elected where the polar, polarity of the people voted for one candidate. Now, you have to look at that. Why? And I would say, to an extent, when Mar Rojas and uh, Ms. Poe ran in uh, six years ago, they represented the elite. And the Filipino people felt the elite had let them down. And they chose a strong man, and they were beset by crime and drugs. And I told them, beware, because you're not upset when he's killing this, this drug dealer, but when he starts killing your son and daughter, you're going to be upset. Um, however, why are the average person in the Philippines interested in a strong man? And we're seeing this around the world. What have the elites failed to understand, failed to capture, that's bringing such nationalism in? We, we talk too much to each other and not the average person. So there is a reason, and I hope to get a better understanding when I go. Obviously, you know, uh, Philippines is a very close society, so I used to go, you would see President, now President Marcos and his mother and his, his, his wife, several, you know, a weekly at, at, at reception. So I, I hope to get a better understanding uh, once I uh, once I go there in in, um, in July. But it's it's clear that we miss something. Yes, uh, Mr. Ambassador, thanks yeah. for coming and sharing your knowledge with us. My question relates to corruption. Yeah, corruption in Ukraine, of course, in the state. Mm -hmm. Could you two aspects? What is, what's, in your experience, what's the level of corruption in Ukraine, either 2014 or now currently? And then when it comes to the aid that's going into Ukraine for military and economic assistance, including $50 billion almost from us and other countries, is the, is the level of corruption sufficient? Should we have to be paying attention to that as it relates to this aid that's going in? Because the number one priority is to get to a stalemate in the war against uh, Putin. So we can't diminish that effort with the aid that we're military and economic. But could you comment on the level of corruption and then what do we do about it going forward so we can't interrupt the aid that's going to bring us in the war if we get to yeah. the Well, thank you. And then I want you to understand. The previous government of Ukraine was very corrupt. We understand that, as many governments around the world are. I also want you to understand that the United States government doesn't give cash to any government. Um, that is, if people think we give cash, we do not anywhere in the world. So that $50 million package, that includes military sales. It's going to include food. Now, how well it's used, it can be diverted. I doubt they're going to divert the military now. I wouldn't worry so much, so much. I'm not saying there's not going to be any corruption. I wouldn't be worried so much about the corruption today, but when they start rebuilding, that is when you have to be careful. And still, we're not going to give money. Uh, but we, in, in, in other countries that I served, whether it's Zimbabwe or the Philippines or Bangladesh, we could make sure that our money was well spent, but they could, they could be stealing from other countries' aid. That happened. Other countries do give money. Or um, they could find their legal stealing too. You know, I, the, you, you're gonna use, most countries we don't use a local contractor, we use an American contractor with local employees to build something. The Chinese use their own, con, their own employees. But you could inflate the price of those contracts, inflate the price of the building. Uh, USAID spends a lot of time on that. So, but that will be the, the time. 
Americans want to say no corruption, 0% corruption. That's not the United States. Okay, well, that's not the United States. But how much can we tolerate? And it shouldn't be 20%, it shouldn't be 35%, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be 15%. But all of that, so if, you, if I send you to Ukraine to, to look at that, you don't speak the language, you don't understand the culture, it's going to be hard. Here's an example. It's not, it's the whole private sector in India. Guy will have three sets of books. Books for himself, books for the company he works with, and a book for the inspector. Young folks like this don't want child labor or slave labor, right? They don't, and Nike doesn't want protest marches or Adidas or whatever. So they say, okay. When you get off the plane, what color any of us here are here? You don't think that Indian guy knows your country? You know, to the factory? Uh, knockoffs, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're, gonna, they're sold. The, when, it, when I was in India, Coach was the one company they didn't mess with because it was so valuable to have a Coach contract. They would do everything legit with Coach. Their brother might do something, but they would do. But everything else, they have the factory running three, you know, three different ships. Uh, so it's very, it's very difficult. Uh, if that, is that guy corrupt? You know, how many is in, in, the, in the home country? Let's say he's not different way of, uh, in Hindi, um, 13 words for diarrhea, none for hypocrisy. <laughs> so understand that before you go there. I hope by at least that we have time for one question more. Clearly, uh, it's no secret there's going to be uh, food shortages uh, in the next couple of years because of Ukraine and uh, Russia. So I imagine uh, the agriculture department, state, are all working together on that. We should be working with other countries like Brazil who can distribute. But at the same time, we, we have helped farmers grow. Uh, whether in the Philippines or Bangladesh or Zimbabwe, USAID and agriculture have helped them as, whether you believe it or not, rainy seasons come different, come later now. And the farmers don't know about the rainy season. So we, we help them, we give them mobile weather apps, telling them when, when to plant, when to harvest. But the bigger challenge is still uh, transportation to market, distribution to market. Um, a lot of them don't have cold storage. We can help them with the cold storage. They lose 60 to 70 percent of their, their goods. Um, they don't have roads to get it to market, and when they get it to market, they can only sell it in many countries, especially former British colonies, to the government. And they have to, the government sets the price first. That that's a, a barrier. It would be very difficult to change, but those are things that would would help. Uh, in a place like the Philippines, you will see that. Fish in many places in a country with 7,000 islands is more expensive than pork, and it should not be. That's because of they've got to go through 14 or 15 middle market persons uh, to, 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 uh, to change that. We did, after starting off slowly, we did a great job of getting the world COVID vaccines. But if you look in Africa, it's about 12% of the people have been vaccinated just because it's so hard to get the vaccinations to them. But eventually we will. And the reason I believe that is because President Bush's greatest achievement with Secretary Powell's was the President's Emergency Program for AIDS Relief, PEPFAR, which saved millions of African lives who were at threat from AIDS. So 
those same distribution systems that we use for PEPFAR, we have to use for COVID. Now, the AIDS wasn't through every country in Africa, so that's the challenge, but we, we, have, to, we have to do that. Um, but it's going, to be, it's going to be dicey because you've got, you know, it's, it's a supply chain. And that's where we should be working. To me, the greatest thing the US military does is logistics. So if, if you really, I would be working with Transcom now, and Transportation Command, who are really busy today. <laughs> They're really busy. But working with them and the private sector, uh, we don't have enough American commercial vessels, frankly, we don't, uh, to help feed the world. And, and, so it, and you can't uh, just build a, a vessel in a year. It's just like now, we don't have enough javelins, right? And there are several types of javelins. It's gonna take over a year just to get up to the, to the, to the javelins. So it, it's going to be a, a challenge, and uh, we probably won't be successful everywhere, but we've proven that we can if, if we get the will.